so I want to start with Universe as Bucky. Uh, no, I need him on. Oh. Um, as Bucky would say, uh, starting with Universe, I'm going to be talking about two things. One is exterior structuring principles and processes, which uh, include both fivefold and fourfold symmetrical um, environments. Uh, and what we're looking at right here is a helix nebula. And most of us, when we look at it, it looks like an eye. But the point of this is that you're looking down into it uh, from the top. And that is an incredible view. So I believe there's a lot going on in the center of, uh, of things. And another galaxy that we can look at, this one was in a picture from um, <laughs> a Hubble image from 2020, the Bard Spiral Galaxy, one of the prettiest spiral galaxies that are out there in the universe. Another one is this galactic pair. There are intersecting gal galaxies and there's a lot of helical <laughs> um, behaviors going on in here. And uh, I would like to um, begin with uh, what I, have been focusing on ever since uh, I first encountered Bucky's work in 1980 is uh, these six key structural principles. The tetrahedron, which is the smallest structural system with inside and out, uh, insideness and outsideness. I think there's a big turbine or vortex in the center of that. Uh, close, closest packing, Bucky called it closest packing instead of close packing, which has a over 400 year history with kept Kepler and uh, a Renaissance um, a Renaissance polymath Cardanus, who Joe has spoken about. Uh, the 12 around one that Bucky had discovered, the seven frequency tetrahedron, uh, 120 sphere and the 20 sphere, which show interprecession. The jitterbug, I want to focus on structure as a process, the fact that all polyhedra can jitterbug. This is something Joe has shown over and over in his beautiful videos. Polyhedral transformations, which is really the contribution to our better understanding of polyhedra as energy events uh, and energy structures. Uh, and also the big question I have is, can the IVM jitterbug, the isotropic vector matrix, uh, which is a nested um, vector, equilibrium um, that is completely intertriangulated. -triang I believe it can, and I believe we can make, we can see what it looks like. Excuse me. Um, geodesics, I want to talk, uh, focus on, you know, Bucky was a purist with icosahedral geodesics, and then class two and class three geodesics, which move on to the other polyhedra as their base. Uh, the quasi-equivalence theory of um, Casper and Klug uh, in the 1960s, um, Bucky was a part of that story, and the Octet Truss, of course, which is also the IVM. Uh, I have been working with the four frequency nested IVM and uh, the, especially the types of nesting that you can find inside of that. And I have found that very few people do that. Uh, also, um, tensegrity, that's uh, another important feature of uh, all of these things. So how do they come together? Are they separate things? Um, I see various people focusing on either tensegrity or close packing or jitterbug or geodesics. Very, very few tend to um, look at uh, how they're all re related. Um, and Bucky did talk about this a great deal, but um, I think we're discovering all kinds of new materials. So I was in the archives for six years and then for 25 years after that, I, I uh, continued, I knew Bucky's work. I read every book he had before I came for the 10 years prior to coming to the um, Institute and the archives. And I have been so inspired by Bucky's earliest models, uh, the models that were surrounding us. You can see me up there with my youngest son, Nicholas, holding up the closest pack uh, styrofoam spheres that we were making. And, uh, and some of Bucky's, uh, Bucky's models in the background. Here's Bucky with his models again at Black Mountain College. And uh, a few years 
ago, I decided I would try to make literally every early, um, early model that he made. Uh, the three models that I'm most inspired by were Russell Chu's in, um, isotropic vector matrix, which from mm -hmm. this picture that's in your private sky, you cannot see the nesting of it. Um, this is actually a one frequency nucleated BE on the inside. And on the outside is a four frequency uh, vector equilibrium. So this should be held by its top vertex and spun. And you can see the color coding that Russell so painstakingly did for over three years making this thing out of toothpicks and glue. Very hard to do. But uh, I think he, he, he achieved a lot of insights from this process. Uh, the me ball was my absolute favorite. Hmm. Uh, Piece. This is a picture from Stanford when they were documenting uh, the models. Um, and this me ball, I, I spent a lot of time looking at the center very closely, trying to figure out what, it, you know, what it's telling us. Uh, the tensegrity spheres uh, that Bucky did after, after Ken Snelson, as his student, um, discovered the property, which he called floating compression. I walk across uh, Stanford and have been for almost 20 years. Uh, I walk across the field to green to the Green Library and his uh, Ken Snelson's beautiful tensegrity. This is a picture I took early in the morning. That's when I go there uh, of the uh, tensegrity. And this is a group of us from uh, one of the the seminars that I taught in the seminar room with the archive, and a lot of wonderful people came to it. Liz Fial, who, uh, who Jay Baldwin, dear friend, her husband, uh, who had passed on before this, uh, this event. And uh, Amanda and Faith from the BFI started to create these, these, these events. The other thing I'd like a, to give a nod to Ed Applewhite, who was my mentor for 15 years, and what we are under is one of the most complex tensegrities that was hanging in the office. Uh, it's from the STARS uh, project about a floating sphere. Um, I have been inspired by the early models and also by the early slides. And I wanna also give a nod to Jeffrey um, Lindsay in Canada, Duncan Stewart and Don Richter, here they are in North Carolina State uh, College. They were making tensegrities based on some of the ideas that Ken had. They made these out of wood. These are literally the first tensegrities that were made out of wood. And I don't think anyone's seen these slides. Uh, I'm also very inspired by the 1951 unpublished manuscript, which was literally a first pass at synergetics. And um, Fuller uh, changed the name of his ge uh, geometric approach to synergetic energetic geometry. And then his final magnum opus was, uh, was um, let's see, I'm gonna put uh, this down so we don't see anybody. Okay, so, um, in here, it's really interesting because I was deeply influenced by over here on the left, the four frequency tetrahedron because nucleation begins at four frequency with the BE and with the tetrahedron. And I wanted to explore that, but it looks like they explored that very early on. But by the same token, uh, Coxeter, Donald Coxeter uh, had um, written about the four frequency tetrahedron. He did not call it that, but he um, presented that in 1939 in the Ball um, Mathematical Recreations, I believe. Um, and on the right, you see these tetrachidecahedra or Lord Kelvin's polyhedra that, that are being closest packed together and bubble packing, uh, you know, has uh, revealed to us that this is um, actually one of the densest ways to close pack polyhedra. I'm also deeply inspired by these great circle spheres. Um, I was able to work with the conservators up at Stanford um, to conserve many of the models and to understand what they were. I did this as a volunteer project 
we were hoping to have gotten a grant for, um, for Shoji and Joe to come. I helped them write the grant. It did not, uh, it did not appear. So, uh, but by the same token, Maria Grandinette um, brought me into the conservation crew. And especially I, after we worked with a lot of models, these models came, these two great circle spheres, you see the 31 great circle sphere and the 25 great circle sphere. I'm in front of the 31 great circle sphere, which is the spin of the icosahedron. And um, you see Bucky and uh, Duncan Stewart holding up some of the jitterbugs that they were making at that time. This is circa 1951 or 52. Hmm. So all of these have inspired me in different ways. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, I, uh, I sort of adopted three resonant architectures of the sphere that uh, drew from that geodesic icosahedral base uh, that God's design drawing from uh, a structural principle that's coming from the inside. These are all at different scales and they're very resonant with each other. Emiliania Huxley, uh, which, which I'll tell you what it is in a moment, Clathrin uh, and Buckminster Fullerene. You can find many things uh, that are uh, built with the truncated icosahedron or designed. You can see those design principles and properties in many things. And if everybody can keep their mute on, that would be great. Uh, while I do my presentation. Um, so I think a lot about uh, scale independence uh, or looking at things through scale as a nested quality of our reality. Mm -hmm. This is a human hair. It looks like uh, um, it looks like a tail of a pangolin. Um, and what we're looking at is all the way from viruses to bacterium to grains of pollen. We're looking at uh, how very tiny these are. And then again, Buckminster Fullerene is even tinier. I think Buckminster Fullerene is uh, completely invisible. Uh, so these structures fit into this framework of scale. Uh, Buckminster Fullerene, everybody knows, is a 60 atom carbon molecule. It's thought to be the most ancient molecule in universe. I used these three archetypal spheres as my logo for many years for media tertia. Uh, clathrin, one of the most important protein molecules in the human body. Now, clathrin is a very interesting basket structure that was first isolated and named by Barbara Pierce. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit resonant with uh, Rosalind Franklin's understanding of, with her X picture, understanding of helixes prior to uh, the DNA structure being um, acknowledged by uh, the two, um, I, I'm missing their names right now, but they're very famous. Um, Emilia, Emiliania Huxley is the most abundant phytoplankton in the ocean. It's a steward, it blooms lower, it, it's blooms actually lower sea surface temperature. So let's look at that first. It's the biggest of these three. Um, the quackalithophores are spherical, they're beautiful, they're uh, basket-like structures. Um, this is the bone structure on the right. These are the blooms on the left. They're huge. They are as big as Texas. These here, you can see how big they are from the continent, but they, they lower sea surface temperature because they bring uh, that reflection of the lighter colors, especially when you see white ones. Um, it's a single cell phytoplankton. The, the disks are calcite. Uh, they're named after micropaleontologists who really is responsible for our first deeper understanding of the cycles of climate change. His name is Cesare Emiliania. I mean, Emiliani, I always talk about Emiliania. Um, and uh, and it, it produces a group of chemical compounds. It um, distributes its way down to the bottom of the ocean. It turns into what we know as, uh, say, the white cliffs of Dover, which are limestone cliffs. Um, now we'll move on to clathrin, the protein in the brain and in the body that exchanges nutrients. Um, 
and information by taking itself apart and putting itself together thousands and thousands of times a day. Thousands of these, probably millions of these little proteins um, actually uh, bring together um, through, uh, through endocytosis, they are able to bring things into the cell or carry things in their basket. It, they're made of uh, numerous triskelions, uh, triskelions uh, the, the triple spiral or the Archimedean spiral, three of them together as a symbol. You can find that in the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and Neolithic period. You can see it in artifacts and in uh, burial uh, megaliths, the interior of the prehistoric tomb Newgrange. This is probably the most famous one. And um, let's look a little bit at how, how these come together and go apart over and over again. This is a, a great uh, folding and unfolding of the brain protein. It's an animation. I took screenshots of the animation long ago uh, by Thomas Kirkhausen and Alison Bruce at Harvard University. So you can see that this beautiful little triskelion has that twist, like a helical twist that comes together and folds into this beautiful basket structure that transports things around the body. Uh, also viruses exhibit, the, I don't have one of those as my archetypal spheres, but I consider them such. Uh, they exhibit geodesic architectures, um, the turnip yellow mosaic virus and the tomato bushy stunt virus, they both exhibit geodesic shapes based on the icosahedron. And um, the focusing on uh, the geodesic quality, um, even for Emiliania Huxley, even the um, viruses that are attacking Emiliania Huxley actually exhibits much more clearly the icosahedral shape. So um, what Casper and Klug did is they established um, the quasi-equivalence theory, which went along really well for 60 years, but now is being expanded on. Uh, let's look at coronavirus, we're all too familiar with. The glycospike, like glycoproteins are actually distributed. This is a little too symmetrical, but they're actually distributed in, in, in interesting ways based on their interactions with the interior helical arrangement of the RNA. Um, this is a bigger artist's uh, representation of the coronavirus. And I've always wondered, and maybe you have, about these tetrahedral spikes that the uh, spikes that um, the glycoprotein spikes are tetrahedrons. Now, um, I haven't approached that at all, but I think that you can all see that it's a very interesting um, phenomenon. Uh, way back in 1962, when the first electron micrographs or my, uh, electron diffusion vi visuals showed viruses, the uh, icosahedral structure, um, Casper and Klug, who are, are Nobel laureates, they developed um, the crystallographic electron mi microscopy. And what they said when they saw this was um, their inspiration by Buckminster Fuller. They show, they, they said in this article, they show the same kind of structure as the domes of Buckminster Fuller. Dr. Robert Horn, who took the first photos explained, uh, we went along working out the mathematics of uh, viruses and somebody told them about Fuller's book. We opened it and there it was, all worked out. It seems that both Fuller and Nature have picked out the most rigid geometry they can find. So Bucky was really a part of that early virus uh, structure uh, understanding of Casper and Kluge. In fact, in the archive, and I think I have a Xerox of it, um, it is one of their articles that include a fairly large amount of Bucky's work. It was never published. And instead um, they did publish their findings um, and attributed Fuller to the inspiration. Um, here he's talking to Klug on the, up at the top and he's talking, this is in the Horizon series, which is we know as Nova. The very first one was in 1964 and it was featuring of all people not scientists, but 
Buckminster Fuller, who was a design, comprehensive, anticipatory design scientist. I think that's a real key part of history that we know, but most people don't know. When he's talking to Horn here, you can see that Horn is talking about enzymes and proteins and what he's finding is seeing little tetrahedrons in the images and Bucky, he said, I don't know what comes together to make these things. And Bucky said, well, let me show you the open triangle. I'll be talking about that a little bit later, but that I think is a kind of a revelation of sorts. Um, then uh, 60 years after that, Radin Twarak is speaking on virus structure. She's been working uh, with many different groups. She's in the University at London, in London. Um, but she describes how viruses continuously exhibit these multiple structural dynamics, both on the inside and the outside. So there's structural characteristics and propensities uh, from both the interior and the exterior. So she uses lattice theory, group theory, Penrose tiling, they take into account the shear stress and material properties of the viruses to understand them. They examine the process of vir virus evolution in the long term, mutations and assembly processes uh, in order to create therapies and vaccines. They've done a lot of work on remdesivir. Um, she uh, looks at these assembly pathways as geometric networks. And so she's advancing forward the quasi-equivalence theory, which basically tells you all of the structuring properties of small viruses, but the larger viruses have very interesting internal and external dynamics. Um, so that is to give you a context that this structural work that we're doing, even if I'm working with something like intuitive geometry and not a mathematician, I'm not doing it as an art form, although here you see Bobby Jaber's beautiful Buckminster Fullerenes as a close packed group. Um, I, in my process a few years back, uh, trying to make Bucky's first models out of anything I could find, uh, I made a close pack 12 around one out of these plastic um, balls that you can get for your Christmas tree to make your own. Um, uh, Christmas ornaments. So in close packing, uh, every one of us knows about the six spheres close, in, close packing around one, um, adding the top layer of three spheres each, you will get this 12 around one um, vector equilibrium if you take the kissing point of spheres. We all know this already, but I wanted to just put this in as a refresher. Well, I really care about the tetrahedron. And one, one thing Bucky said was keep on tetrahedroning, which I love um, the idea of, so I've been continuously working with tetrahedra. Now this, uh, I will show you a little bit later. Um, this model on the left is the seven frequency um, tetrahedron that uh, also can show by taking the two parts apart. Um, can show interprecession, which is that that if you move the angling, the precession is the uh, effect of moving bodies on other moving bodies. But pre interprecession is uh, more of an internal dynamic of structure itself. So the twenty sphere, uh, three frequency tetrahedron, and the seven frequency tetrahedron also um, are show the interprecession. Um, the interprecession, you can see it here. Bucky talked about it uh, as um, a kind of a growing nested structure. Uh, the open triangle that I was talking about earlier with Robert Horn and Buckminster Fuller, um, you know, Bucky said triangles cannot be structured into planes. They are always positive and negative helixes. The triangles were in fact never closed because no line can completely come back onto itself. Um, he made a big point about two lines not being able to intersect at, uh, come through the same point at the same time. And so he saw the triangle itself as a spiral. And this gave me another insight into something real twisty is going on in the center of a tetrahedron. Um, 
So uh, the open triangle, I made some with my zone tools. Uh, you can see here when you put these things together, they make a tetrahedron. And I don't, I haven't seen a lot of people working with this. Um, again, the tensegrity issue, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but in a talk I did about Leonardo da Vinci and Bucky, uh, I've always seen Leonardo da Vinci's bridge, this packable bridge of modular components, how that uh, could be carried on the road and put together very quickly without tools. Uh, I don't know if Bucky was inspired by this. I don't know if this particular uh, sketch was accessible to Bucky at the time, but he was influenced by the prefab um, work uh, and uh, of using the hexagonal approach way back when he was doing the Dymaxion house. Um, now, another thing, Pensegrity, I just have to show this picture because I love it. Uh, at Stanford, one of the collabor visual visualization collaboratories that uh, I did uh, with some wonderful colleagues um, brought people from, some came from all around the world to come to this. And I take them through a, an experience that I believe Bucky himself did, but many after him did, was, which is where you bring everybody into a circle and then they sit on each other's laps and they're only held together by tensegrity. So you get that feeling of that tension and how powerful it is. Um, also biotensegrity and the work of Donald Ingber, who in this 1998 Scientific American, he was featured for his discovery, which he was beginning uh, to have um, in the last years of Bucky's life, uh, and he wrote to Bucky about it, Bucky thought it was a, a powerful, powerful viewpoint that needed to be um, seen. Um, the me ball, back to the me ball. Now this has always excited me by the twist that's on the interior. So you look at the interior and it's an icosahedral. So it's a spherical icosahedron. Every one of the uh, tension members that go onto the inside carry that twist that they have on the outside. So the tetrahedron, when you open it up a little bit, you can get that ball in the center. The reason why Bucky called it a me ball was because it was the methane molecule, ME for methane, four hydrogen atoms surrounding a carbon atom. He was very fascinated with that. I have not heard people speak on that. Uh, Joe, I would love to hear talk about this at some point. Um, here's a couple more pictures of it. Uh, the ball is suspended in the center. This is a beautiful piece that Carl Solway, um, his gallery uh, made and sold. And uh, I took a picture of this at the Black Mountain College exhibit in LA a number of years ago. Um, Another thing that's really cool, and I think Kirby will appreciate this, is the A and B mods. You know, this is part of, I think it's a grandniece, Sarah of Buckminster Fuller, um, had a, ca a cache of uh, artifacts and videos and files that were on eBay. And uh, I know Joe and I, and a number of people, including Tom Sung and others, um, we're really uh, trying to get Stanford to go ahead and buy these because I believe they were the very first uh, modules. And I believe they go back to maybe circa 1950, maybe all the way to 48. I, it's really hard to tell. Um, so let's look at that me ball. And the reason why I have that picture of the volumes is Bucky broke up the tetrahedron from the center using the A and B mods to make it up. But I thought, what happens if I make a tetrahedron out of clay and I uh, begin to cut it on the side, then across the face at a true frequency, and then turn it, twist it. The whole time I'm twisting to go into it, and I, I'm sure everybody can see this here. Um, and you can see when it opens up that it has that turbine. So looking closer at this turbine, what does it remind you of? You can see that there's twisting going on. 
and it's very much like a three-blade propeller. And in Bucky's earliest chronophile, uh, I'm fascinated by the picture that he had. This isn't the one, but it, this is the RMS Olympic. It was a sister um, ship to, uh, to the Titanic. This is a 1911 picture. And on the right and the left, you see the three blade propellers. And uh, just thinking about what this looks like, it looks like a propeller. You can see the twist in propellers. And I think that Bucky might have had a picture of this because he was fascinated by the twist. He was already working with tension and compression members that hold a hexagonal Dymaxion house up. And um, so I, I believe that uh, what we see is some kind of tensegrity action going on. It also reminds one of the triskelions that are part of the clathrin protein baskets. This is so cool. I, I love this sense because what, we, what we're seeing, if we're looking at that blade, it's as if you're looking at, uh, say, the universe, the helix nebula um, from the top. So what you're seeing is these twists, and I think that, uh, that Gary Doskus' work really shows this well, um, is a, a larger helical formation. It's, it's almost like a pressure and a stress that is, is defining uh, the exterior structures that are possible. And Clathrin shows this very well. What it shows is uh, another thing I was very excited about early on and always, uh, Buckminster Fuller on precession. He talked about the orbits uh, that are going where planets around the sun and the sun around the galaxy and all of these combinations of movements that he calls the curvaweva spiral linear movements. Um, no path can be linear. So, and I believe that what we see is with the field structures that Don Riddell has been doing, we are seeing that over and over that, that twisting and that kind of Mobius quality. Well, we see it on every scale, which is why I think scale independence is a really important, uh, important perspective. Um, so I've been working with not just the tetrahelix, but the nested tetrahelix. Um, you know, Bucky also said all actions are spiral because they cannot go through themselves and because there is time. He added time to this concept. Uh, the remote aspect of a spiral is a wave because there are no planes. I think that's another key thing that maybe all of these tensegrities are actually some kind of tension-based structural principles. We certainly see it in DNA and RNA. We uh, see it in uh, the Helix Nebula. We see it um, in acacia blooms. Uh, um, if you look at them carefully, they look like a double helix. So in here, what you see is an octahelix in a tetrahelix, the yellow being the tetrahedra, the, uh, the nested octahedra on the interior. Um, so I made a models for the, over the pandemic, I started to get these CMS magnetic uh, model materials. Um, and I started making, you can see I didn't have all enough colors, but what you can see on the inside here is the nesting of the four frequency. So you take four frequency tetrahedrons and you put them together in a tetrahelix and you color code them to show the interior, which is almost like an armature. So this is the interior here. Um, the blue are the octahedrons and the yellow are the vector equilibriums. They're not nucleated because I didn't have enough CMS magnets at the time. Um, but uh, you can see that you have both a, an octahelix and a VE helix, um, a cube octahelix. So everything jitterbugs, as Joe Clinton shows us, but everything helixes as well is just how do they do it and how do they nest and how do they combine to form new structures. Um, I also was inspired by somebody, uh, Joe sent me some beautiful um, uh, papers and websites <laughs> of anybody that's really worked with these things. Nobody had done the nested <coughs> work that I will be showing you the tri helix, but I did make a pentahelix here. 
then I would I tried to pull these things together. So this octahel or this tetrahelix, um, <clears throat> I tried to pull it into a Mobius structure, and I started to make a lot of. You have to fudge it, obviously. And Joe Clinton has done some work with this, showing the rings of, and not as a Mobius uh, um, cylinder circle, but <clears throat> as a, excuse me, as a um, tetrahelix that has curvature. Uh, I did this on a higher frequency. The one on the right is, the, again, the octahelix is on the inside, the red tetrahelix is on the outside. But if I go back to many, many years ago, Bobby Jaber gave me his old Rogers connections, tons of them, and I just started to make models. And I kept making this silly model of a seven frequency tetrahedron in the center, you see. And I said to myself, okay, so what if we do a three frequency tetrahelixes out of every, every face? So I did that. And I kept on walking around this because it's a very large structure, as you can see. And I started to see, wow, this looks like an icosahedron, um, but it also isn't quite, it's almost like the icosa in the middle of its transformation into a uh, vector equilibrium. I finally, after a few years, I came back to it and I closed it up. And here on the right, you can see that it looks very much like a uh, vector equilibrium. So moving to the jitterbug, I keep on thinking about these models that I'm making. What do they look like when they move? Um, and the other thing, defining the twist, is here's the zone tools again, where the only way you can nucleate an icosahedron is if you have twisted or a twist inside the struts that connect to the center. Um, so I've been studying this structure a great deal, and um, it was all in black, so I couldn't see the internal dynamics. It, uh, oops, this slide shows some of the work that others have done in putting these together, which I hadn't seen till after I made this, but where you can see the 7.36 degree uh, openings if you try to close up an icosahedron. So it's partially going through its transformation. That's what I take from it. But over here in certain light, uh, this was taken at night under a certain type of light. You can see the nesting just from every, uh, every of the three main faces, you can see the nesting of the pentagons. So. And these are tetrahelixes that are coming together and they are making this structure on the outside or their stresses are actually defining structural characteristics on the outside. Um, sure, you can, you can make uh, tetrahelixes come out of a, a tetrahedron. And I did this here. What happens if you just keep on going? They all go straight up. But if you have them curve on themselves, they turn into what uh, we saw earlier a propeller-like structure. So I made these propellers. Again, I didn't have enough of the right colors, um, uh, enough CMS magnets to do this, but you can see on the left is the two-frequency nested tetrahelix, tri-tetrahelix, which is what I call this. And from the top, again, the, uh, the one, two, three, four frequency tetrahelix. So the four frequency is fully nested with the VEs and the octas. Um, again, this uh, looking at this closer, this is just the two frequency. And if you look on the interior, the only way I could get these to go with that uh, opening that we're talking about, the 7.36 degree openings that are in the icosahedron when they want to pack together, um, you can see in the center of this is a tensegrity. One thing I learned with the tensegra toys was uh, the mama baby. So every strut has to go over the next strut. And this is a type of tensegrity um, behavior. Bucky talks about it as, you know, you take the center ball out of a VE and the center becomes a, uh, uh, gets small enough 
to have an icosahedron. So over here, you can see on the left, it's an icosahedron. On the top, I've already taken off the, um, <coughs> in the middle, excuse me, um, <clears throat> the uh, octa tri, uh, tri octahelix, you can see. I couldn't get all of these interior structures, the armature, had to stay there, the center, to keep these together. But you can see they start to curl around themselves in a unique kind of way. Um, this was my Christmas one, a two frequency with the interior structure. And you can, you know, I've looked at these things and built them and unbuilt them uh, so many times that every time I look at the structure, I can see the beautiful on the left. If you can see, there's a pentagon and inside that pentagon is a pentagram. And in inside of that, you see this, uh, tetrahelix, helixing and pentagons, helixing and icosahedral um, uh, shapes. Um, so I will just show you another little video very quickly, just making this in a fast mode. So I tried numerous ways of doing this, and this is where I just thought, okay, let's just do the colors where each has its own color scheme. So now you can see here, you can see that what this looks like if it was made of different colored um, shapes. Oh, come on, here we go. Sorry about this. I have to go to the next one. Okay, back to, then I, <laughs> I started looking, okay, what happens if you cr create one of those Mobius uh, uh, rings and then build tetrahelixes on, off of those? And I ended up with what I call the quintahelix. You may look at this and say, this is definitely art, not science. It doesn't say anything about anything. It's beautiful though. If you look at it from the top, when it's almost done on the left, you can see very clearly the star shape, the pentagons, the pentagons within pentagons. And on the right, if you go a little bit further, you can see these interesting dynamics of the twist where these five tetrahelixes want to come together. So I look at what's on the inside of them, what is the armature, and what are they trying to tell us about how they come together. And the only way you can do this is not with a solid one. It's certainly with one that I, and the way that I've approached it. Um, then I, I put together, I got very excited um, about what would happen if I did this where there's a chiral, uh, where we do it, uh, where there's uh, a chiral pair, one coming out of the bottom and one coming out of the top. So I bought a magnetic or a, a steel <laughs> little um, table and I tried to make that. And um, <clears throat> here's just a, it because, uh, I can see a very, very, uh, an hour and, a half long. Yeah, and this is a while back, so off. I had to use old and, uh, there. Okay, so this structure, if you look on the right, you can see that I have made chiral structures with these, but on the left, you can see, you know, that it's just a, a double tet um, that, you know, that has all of the, the helixing going on in both directions, uh, right-handed and left-handed. Um, so going back to the nested tetrahedron, uh, uh, here you can see clearly the octahedron in blue, the VE in yellow, the red pet from the top. You can see these as well. Um, actually, this is a tritet, not a pet. It's hard to tell. <laughs> Uh, I think this was the tetrahedron from the top. Then I built a higher tetrahedron. Again, I didn't have, I sh the green and red should be all red. But again, you can see if you build a tetrahedron that big, you're gonna have nesting all over the place. And if you pull it apart, you also have intersecting tetrahedra. And again, the nested octas and the nested VEs. All of the nesting really came from that 
uh, beautiful IVM made of toothpicks by Russell Chu that we had in the Institute in the office on top of the Thonet bookshelf and um, how the VE nests at frequency four. Again, I did not have enough uh, green or red to completely make this easy to see, but you can see the structure inside. Um, over here, we can see the uh, structure I just talked about, the IBM, nested IBM for frequency. Um, and then on the right is the tetra, tri-tetrahelix. So this one on the right, you can tell that it's, it's moving toward the icosahedron, but it's also moving away from what the VE is. So I started to think about what is going on in the interior if the IVM actually jitterbug, which I cannot do with physical models, uh, but Gerald said maybe he could do that. Um, I hope that's possible in uh, the virtual realm, realm with no uh, gravity and with different kinds of dynamics. Um, here's the IVM again. And you know, when you look at these enough, you can see the interior. I think if you're just coming upon it, no, you can't because they didn't have all the right colors. Um, but let's just take off all the red and you can start to reveal all of the VEs and the octas. And if you take it off further, you have almost a nice beautiful sculpture of the interior nesting of all of these octas and VEs. And they all are symmetrically unified to a common center. But remember, this is the IVM. This is the inside of the IVM. If it's not nested in the way that Russell Chu did, where you, where you can clearly see only the nesting of different shapes, here you have the multiple nesting of the same shape. And here's the, uh, you know, the different phases of it on the left. It's all together uh, in the middle, the red is taken out. On the right, we're starting to take off, I'm starting to take off all the green as much as I can. Um, so I called these a, um, I don't know if you can see this, but um, on the left, I called that uh, floating equilibria. And Here's the top view of the tri-tetrahelix, three helixes coming together, fully nested, take, starting to take them apart. Then wandering equilibria, which on the left, you can start to see the way that this interior armature of nested VEs and octas come together um, to create the structure that you see when the tets are fully present. And finally, the floating equilibria and wandering equilibria side by side. The right has the twist, the left is very symmetrical and, you know, goes out in all directions, does exactly what a VE does, but it's the tetrahelix and the combination of tetrahelixes that I think really speak to that internal and external dynamics, the structural propensity that's in both. And I believe that's it. So uh, if everybody will come back and I will stop share, uh, we're not gonna take a break between questions, but if everybody takes their mute off, we can have a little discussion of questions, any questions you have, or those that you may have put in the um, chat. Okay. Um, before we start, I see that Casey wrote, reminds me of uh, quantumgravityresearch.org. I am always watching their videos. Fang Fang, who does the 57 group, uh, Tony Smith, who I've read his stuff for years, literally um, 22, 25 years. Um, the quantum gravity research group, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, they're not, there's, they're a group of scientists, but I, I do believe that what she, Fang Fang especially, is finding on the interiors of the um, 
the tetrahelixing around the center helix is very, very um, resonant with this. And I like to use the word resonant because, you know, it rhymes versus uh, is direct replication. Okay, so I would like to open to questions. Anybody uh, who would like to um, ask any, oh, Bob yeah. Gray, sorry. Bob Gray, thank you for coming. I'm so happy to see you. Okay, Gary, your question. Yes, I, I, I recognize similarities too in, in a lot of your structures with the 57 group. And when I play with some of these structures, I can see your arrangement of that icosahedron type structure. And that I can see in my simulator as a complete single um, tetrahelix. That would be, you could have a particular sequence to join those 20 together. And, and when they're superimposed, four of them create 57 in, in the exact sort of arrangement as a 57 group. So I see a lot of similarities there between your work and, and uh, Fung's work, as, as well as stuff I've observed. Yeah, I would like to see what this looks like using your um, modeling. Uh, package that you created uh, that shows the uh, spheres, the sphere packing, what does that tritetrahelix as a cluster of spheres um, look like? What do those uh, clear spheres define? I haven't done that because yeah. I don't have that and I don't know how to use it. Yeah, I, I, pro I have a, uh, probably half a different, half a dozen different ideas you, you, you know, got me thinking about. Um, I've also observed what creating a lot of these tetrahelix designs that they have a natural tendency to create five-sided structures or, or pentastructures. And, and recently I started looking into what I call a, a dodeca helix. It's kind of like a pentahelix, but basically it's a helix of, of dodecahedrons. And now it's a sequence of five. So each sequence has a, one of five rotations of 72 degrees. And that had a tendency to make seven pointed objects there's so that that sort of plus two relationship in, in a lot of these helix formations that naturally you know come out of the structures yeah i i mean i think these tetrahelixes are fascinating uh because they hold a tension and they have the tensegrity aspect like built into them and they're always seeking these certain shapes that keep happening over and over. I think your rhombic shape that you put in Mighty Networks a couple of weeks ago reminds me of the 57 group. So the structures that I'm showing you or my spheres, my uh, my archetypal spheres um, uh, are um, are are just shapes that are in the physical world but when you get to that quantum scale you see some of the similarities happening again and again and again so thanks gary love your love everything you presented this group is has been uh jaw dropping frankly any questions comments discussion points Bonnie, this is joe have you looked at the uh, in, in the nesting of the polyhedron? I noticed most of your nesting deals with the vector equilibrium and the uh, tetrahedron and the octahedron. But have you noticed the higher forms of the polyhedron nesting as well? Oh, you mean like uh, like complex polys? Well, like polys? one of the simplest would be the uh, truncated tetrahedron. Oh, the truncated tet. Yeah. Yeah. That would be one, obviously, but I'm I'm pretty sure that there are a number of others as well, especially the you, you've gone up to what seven frequency? Seven frequency tet. Now that's what this one is. Yeah. Which, well, I built it really just to show what Bucky talked about with precession, you know, how these come together. Yeah. <clears throat> When you when you go to a higher even higher frequencies, you'll start to find that that you'll have higher frequencies of the nesting material. So in uh, other words, the octahedron has higher frequency as well in nesting. So it means that you've got those. 
But then you start to see some of the higher order polyhedral forms that will also be nesting. And I was wondering if you had looked into any of those. Not yet, but I, I want to keep on building frequency higher yeah. and higher if I can. Uh, but I think that the engagement of all our intelligences, the multiple, starting with seven with Howard Gardner in the 80s, yeah. um, and there are far more now, but if you're engaging all of your senses, you can discover things, even if you're an intuitive, intuitive geometer or an artist. Uh, for instance, what Prithi has shown us with the work that he's done on the... Um, the, um, um, what's the word for it? it starts with an M, the, uh, the, what, what the was it showing? More the a? Yeah, the more, more, yeah. Um, yeah, I think with the more, you also, you, you can see the superposition of things that are happening, but mm -hmm. you can create these things as an artist, or as for me, you know, a person who's like, well, I've been building these things forever, but I don't know enough. I know all the families of polys, but there's just so much to learn. And um, I was lucky for all these years, Bobby, since 1993 or four, since 1994, um, I, I've, I've, Bobby and I have been both exploring all the different families as he applies it to porcelain and you know, embedded design. Uh, motifs and the duels, um, looking at how can you create a duel that's on, one on the inside and the other on the outside. Mm. So I, I wish I had more materials, but uh, we also have great, you work with uh, spring dance um, and Gerald works with uh, his, um, his, what is yours called Ger Gerald, if you're there? Yeah, it's a, uh... It's called the elastic interval geometry. It's just a way of uh, doing the numbers. Yeah, and, and you've been doing that for many years, Gerald. Uh, I think that we now have enough uh, things to work with on a digital realm, but to do it physically is really hard. Bonnie, I, I was looking at your work in terms of um, uh, shells, uh, like in the atomic structure, you have these uh, seven different shells in which the electrons organize themselves. And I would really like to explore uh, with how you're putting things together, uh, what could be determining the limitations of each shell as far as being able to accommodate um, a, uh, an electron in that shell. Uh, there's got to be a connection here. And I would be really interested to see if we could uh, get to a point where we could determine structurally why there is just a limit to the number of electrons that can be in a certain shell. And it must be something to do with this geometry of uh, that you're exploring where the internal structure of the event is going to have to have certain kinds of configurations in order to accommodate the energy. Um, that's where I see a lot of utility in uh, the work you're doing for from what I'm working with. And I, I want to say it's really a great presentation you just gave. Absolutely astounding. Love it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Yeah, I made a note. I wanted to ask you more questions or more uh, description on it. These triskelions that you referred to. Um, can you go into that a bit more? Um, Oh, uh, well, triskelions, uh, you mean the ones that are, we see in Clathrin or the ones that are symbolic? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the ones, I guess, I guess that the, the, um, the sort of three-pointed structure, which I guess it's a four-pointed structure. Oh, three-arm or four-arm. Uh, Hermann Weyl wrote in his book, Symmetry, he wrote about both of them. And that was during the time that the Nazis 
were, uh, I mean, it, it was 39, I believe that he wrote that and he uh, reflected on the ancient symbol of the, um, the Nazi um, um, swastika. Swastika, but the swastika has been found in many cultures way back as far as our records go as a symbol also. So the four-armed and the three-armed triskelion or tetraskelions are very common in, um, in symbols. Unfortunately for us, uh, Hitler ruined that symbol and it was banned in Germany for years. I they recently ended the ban and here we are again in a situation where our symbols are profoundly important. So I think that people were, in order for those symbols to emerge in different cultures, they were familiar with, they are built on nature, particularly seed pods that kind of burst open and, you know, Bucky uh, built the seed pod dome that does that and then Hoberman, uh, Chuck Hoberman and all the Hoberman spheres, um, you know, where you have that expanding and contracting. My thing is seeing the expansion this way. And I do think that triskelions and tetraskelions, the way Clathrin is put together, and this is, you know, this is the design science of universe, the way Clathrin puts itself together and takes itself apart using uh, triskelions, nobody's made models of that as a modeling system. Uh, I think they're fascinating because I only showed a few examples of where we might find them, but uh, I was working on a book, Shape of Thought, where we I have a chapter with like uh, 15 different examples of different cultural approaches to understanding that. Why? Well, probably because it's an essential structuring principle. Yeah, it has a self-assembly kind of look to it, right? Yeah. And, and there was three interweaved structures. Is it with that, that the one you were showing had? Uh, the uh, clathrin? Yeah. Um, yeah, the picture of or the clathrin, which is made of little triskelions. You can see with this red one how under and over their baskets, just like uh, a weave, weaving themselves together into these. Um, hollow baskets that can transport and then, you know, through endocytosis, put it in like bringing viruses into your body. It does that too. It's not just a steward or a transfer transfer of information and nutrients, but it's also very much a, um, you know, uh, an archetypal form, excuse me, and an archetypal structuring principle. So structuring processes are the things that, you know, I think, you know, we're also looking at and what are the, you know, what are some of, for lack of a better word, all that is or God is telling or goddess is telling us by the way that she creates form, which goes back to Bucky's idea of wanting to know how nature, nature's technology works, how she does what she does. When when you in that in that structure, when you take a, a, one of the forms like the dodecahedron, or you take the ice, the uh, in that case, I think it's the dodecahedron, and do the jitterbug transformation, and allow that the the chiral form of that transformation, which is largely what I work with, and allow it to pass through itself it gets that spiral short form that occurs in that, in that transformation. Uh, the vector equilibrium does the same thing. I mean, it'll, it passes through itself and it turns itself inside out in the process. So uh, what I find is, is some of the animation forms, or animated films that you do of that, you can, if you allow the edges to define the geometry of the enclosure, you get the volumes of what you're seeing. I, I don't know whether I made myself clear on that or not, but uh, it's very similar to taking the intersection of cylinders, which is another form. And if you do the Boolean operations on those, where you do a unity of, of uh, let's say, the axes of a, uh, 
uh, the face axes of the polyhedron. And then you take the face axes uh, and, and you uh, union that so that they become one unit instead of however many axes you have there. And then you take the axes of, let's say, the face axis and you do a unity of that. Then you do an intersection. You have one of what I call a stellated form of the intersection of those, those uh, cylinders if the axes are treated as a cylinder. If you make them as hollow cylinder, then you can see the construction of the intersections of those cylinders to each other as you do a jitterbug transformation of them. And those forms show up. So again, it's it's quite interesting to see how that relationship that you're getting in the curvatures of the packing of the, the tetrahelix is getting that same transformation that's starting to show up in this form. Well, I always thought it was really amazing how your structural process that surprised Bucky when you were able to make a, ten, a, a tetrahedral um, jitterbug, you had the two faces twist. Right. And then, and then uh, Prithi was showing the faces twisting, actually showing new kinds of forms on the yes. exterior. And that reminds me of that interior dynamics that are reflected on literally every scale and every part of the transformation. Meaning, mm -hmm. every, and that's what happens when I look at your uh, animations, Joe, I, I can see all of those dynamics. And what I see are tensegrities opening up and closing up. Oh, yes. Oh, tensegrities are, are basically the duels in one thing, just like yeah. how Bobby creates porcelain duels together. You, you you have two things going on at the same time, and I think, uh, or or multiple things going on at the same time. Um, and uh, but I I also wonder, have you created physical models of what you're talking about? Yeah. Well, I've done three D printed models of them, of many of them. Um, and, and it's interesting that you're saying the transformations of the, of the, the uh, tensegrities follow those transformations, and that's very definitely the case. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to take the six strut uh, tensegrity model and allow the, the uh, uh, edges to either expand or contract, or you allow the, the, the uh, compression elements to expand or contract, or you do combinations of those, you will end up with a lot of stable forms that are, are not the conventional six struts in Segrity where all of the beams are parallel to each other and, and all of the, uh, the tension elements are the same length and that type of thing. I mean, and it's very interesting to see the transformation of those forms as they go through uh, just in the alteration of those beam links or the, uh, the, the uh, tension element links because they go through those same kind of forms. Yes. In transformation. Yes. So I think that uh, ultimately what, what would be so cool to see is, uh, I, I see it in my mind, I saw it well before I even, uh, I even met Bucky. Um, I saw these geometric forms that were triple and that coming together and going apart and everything was done with that, uh, that torque and that twist and the turbining that happens, which is why you see the same thing going on with uh, the me ball on the interior as what you see on the exterior with all the struts opening up um, so that you can see the dual of one polyhedron at a certain stage of transformation. So what we've been doing all along is we haven't been looking at the processes of design, I think, and we haven't been able to. And what Bucky did was he added to our, our nomenclature with the jitterbug this idea that we can show the movement and transformation of polyhedra as energy systems. Mm -hmm. And we're just on the cusp of being able to show multiple new, I think all of you are, uh, multiple new ways of understanding structural processes or dynamics, dynamical structuring principles. Uh, I would almost call it a dynamical, well, I did call it that, um, dynamical structural processes right. that I think 
I, I presented this to you guys because of two things. One is uh, because I've been working on it long enough and I built tons of models over the pandemic period um, that, that I have enough to show that what I'm inching toward, but also I don't know if it's relevant at all and how, except for when I look at biological or chemical or quantum dynamics, structural dynamics. So, um, so I, I, I mean, I would love to work with somebody that um, could, I don't know, to could use this to to visualize something digitally that can't be visualized when I just put these together. Um, I think what I'm doing is making a conjecture. <laughs> Versus, I remember Kirby years ago at CINEL when we were all on the listserv, the oldest synergetics listserv, and he he uh, um, he said that. Uh, what did you say, Kirby, about that? If I you're going to have to remind me more. I just who heard my last sentence? I'm sorry, I just lost it. Some, some event where we both were talking to some. Yeah, anyway, you you schooled me on a couple of things that were happening. Um, uh, and uh, and then I was saying, well, you know, the 24 cell reminds me of the VE and is there a corollary there? And, and then you called it the Bonnie conjecture, <laughs> which was just, you know, silly. But the point is, is that if you're an artist or a designer or a an intuitive geometer, you don't know all the, mathematical details and the possibilities that are there, but you might stumble upon things that people who, uh, you know, are just scientists are not going to find because they start with the math. They don't start with the physical models like Bucky talked about. I, um, I'm Carl and I, I, I was just going to say maybe two things that, that our human bodies and probably many other animals actually have, I have heard, have a virus, some viruses, tra friendly viruses that are very helpful that are part of our cells, inside our cells, and they help us produce our energy and heat so that each cell is able to uh, uh, have its own energy and produce its own heat. Uh, and that uh, I, I had never heard that, that the structures that do that, uh, the viruses that do that inside each of our cells, uh, uh, you know, are just that. They, they're, they're very fortunate. Uh, and uh, uh, that is, we're fortunate that in the evolution that, that uh, we, we do have such helpful viruses, I think, that have evolved in our cells that help us produce energy. Uh, yep. The second... Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, okay. Well, the second thing, which is somewhat unrelated that I was going to say is that uh, 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 Linus Pauling, uh, uh, in, in his uh, huge, uh, thick uh, uh, textbook, uh, uh, on chemistry, uh, uh, he has a small section on what he calls ligancy, where uh, he takes really the five or so platonic uh, uh, solids, uh, he, he, he puts a sphere uh, in the, uh, at the vortex of each of them, uh, and he, he, so to speak, asks the question, uh, uh, if we are going to put one centered sphere in the middle of it, uh, uh, does anything happen uh, interesting uh, as that uh, center sphere gets bigger and bigger or smaller and smaller uh, uh, with regard to uh, if it gets too big, then it pushes outward against the uh, say the uh, tetrahedron uh, 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 shape or form of the uh, four uh, surrounding spheres. Uh, uh, and you know, if it gets 
the centered sphere gets too small, then the uh, four uh, surrounding spheres sit and they touch each other. And, and of course, you know, what he, what he finds is that uh, the very, the, the, the characteristics, the physical characteristics such as melting point or boiling point, uh, when that centered sphere finally gets so small that uh, the, say in the tetrahedron, that the four surrounding spheres can touch each other and still uh, uh, not worry about the centered sphere uh, uh, deforming it, uh, that you have one set of uh, characteristics and that those characteristics are drastically altered when that centered sphere gets so big that uh, it, it, it kind of nudges the four surrounding spheres uh, so they no longer touch each other. And now, here we're talking that the, the chemistry, the, the spheres I'm talking about are the real sizes of, uh, of atoms. And uh, you know, so, so, I mean, this, this sort of thing has uh, uh, significant applications in organic uh, chemistry. So I guess that those are the only two comments I wanted to insert. Well, thank you for your comments. I think the first one uh, that you were talking about viruses is uh, in a recent talk that I did or a number of years ago, I discovered something I didn't know, which was, you know, we all talk about the microbiome that, you know, that we're really communities of biota or we're, we're communities of uh, of uh, bacteria and many of the bacteria are uh, good bacteria and 10,000 more viruses are in our bodies as well. And there's actually a term for it, the human virome. So that includes good viruses and bad viruses. They're, they're part of our evolutionary process. So I think that's a really key thing. And what you were talking about, the spheres, you know, it sounds to me very much like the uh, explorations of the circumsphere and the intersphere, where uh, even back in the Rena Renaissance, um, they, uh, artists, scientists or artists would, uh, look at that circumsphere of, you know, the, poly, the five polyhedra inside of the sphere and then the sphere inside of the, the faces that touches each face. It's similar to the way architects and designers and masons had worked with the, um, the Joe, help me here, the <laughs> compass. Uh, they use the compass to look at how many things, how many, uh, types of polygons can you get out of a, a, a out of a circle and then you apply that to a three-dimensional um, uh, understanding of the sphere and that's where Kepler got his Mysterium Co Cosmographicum classic image that uh, Casey showed recently um, the uh, the um, lost my crane of thought on that but in any case uh, Casey showed that in his presentation uh, few weeks ago. So I mean, all of these dynamics that we just think of them as dynamical processes that are going on every single second of our lives, um, you know, Catherine's that great example of it, that there are things going on in our brain that attune us to certain forms, and certain beauty forms, such as anything that is built with phi uh, as a basis. And this combination of fourfold, sixfold, Fivefold symmetry in a nested fashion is the cosmic hierarchy that Kirby talks a lot about, and that I still don't quite understand <laughs> that well. But the nesting of everything is key, and the fact that we are communities of viruses, and you know we are each a walking community, and then outside of us are our community, and then there's the biomes, and you know bigger and bigger. So nesting happens all the way out and all the way in. And understanding the sphere and the difference between the arcs and the, you know, that nothing's linear that Bucky talks about, then we're really starting to move into new dimensions because we include that curvature and that angular and curvature 
angular relationships and the curvature relationships that um, that are occurring all the time, changing, morphing, mutating. Um, so that's why I think that um, the tetrahelix is also a good, uh, you know, a good thing to play with, as Gary knows so well. <laughs> um, it, it is just endless, endless discoveries you can make. And also with circumscribing and inscribing the sphere with different polyhedra. So one of the things that stuck out to me with, with uh, your presentation was, yeah, the, the arising of the fivefold symmetry uh, in, the, in the spiraling. And it got, it got me wondering about the propensity of fivefold symmetry in organic forms and how uh, the five the fivefold symmetry of the icosahedron and the dodecahedron and the relationships and phi and all, all of the all of that and then the fivefold symmetry of DNA and when I was looking at the the helixing of uh, I, I can't remember the name you had for it, the the, the trihelix trihelix uh, yeah yeah uh, I, I just kept thinking of DNA when I was looking at that and and how uh, just one just wondering about that and also I think it's so fascinating that you can take you know a tetrahedron which doesn't have fivefold symmetry and then have it spiral and reveal fivefold symmetry and so there's just this it, I find it so fascinating and it's kind of boggling my mind how how nature exhibits fivefold symmetry and a lot of organic forms and wondering if it comes from non fivefold symmetry things just through the spiraling process. So yeah, thank thanks for this presentation. It's really sparked a lot of interesting questions for me. Thank you, Casey. Yeah, I think that's why I've been so intent on what's going, you know, figuring out what's going on in the middle of that tet. You know, that tetrahedron has all the keys inside of it because it is its own dual, which is huge because it itself can penetrate itself. And Bucky, you know, loved um, uh, the Stella Octangula is what uh, Kepler called it. The duotet is what Bucky called it. And the star tetrahedron or the elevated octahedron is what um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, called it. So, and Bucky has a number of sketches that, that attest to that. So he's, he's also, um, you know, really uh, drawing from the past, even though he never cited anybody. Uh, he mentioned Kepler, but he never created any citations. But if we look closer at the helix and, the, and what's going on inside, the turbining that's inside of every tetrahedron that, and that allows it to create five-fold symmetrical structures, that I think is a key. And I know we're a minute after nine, and we usually have a hard stop at nine. Um, is uh, there any other question, comment, uh, before we head out? To our I was just, I was going to throw something in real quick if I could. Yeah. Absolutely. I was just noticing that that we got that whole triple prop, both to the point and to the face, and expanded in a contracted one. That's obvious in our base model. So cool. just cool. throwing that out as an observation. And so that's an intersphere. It's not a circumsphere. A circumsphere would be on the outside of that tet. But, mm -hmm. um, but uh, also, if you turn that so that we can see one of the uh, intersections of the three right there, yeah, push that right to your screen. This is so important. And I brought this up to Don. In Don's models, what you have there is a tensegrity. No question. That vortexial relationship, the mama baby relationship between those uh, three coming at those, those uh, almost vertexes um, are tensegrities. So we see that we're looking at helixing and tensegrity in this model as well in the field structure models of Don Bridell. Thanks, Al.